So here we are. Uh, let's do some BIM, shall we? So tonight I'm going to do a bit of an introduction. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to do some introductory stuff, just thinking around process and what it means. Uh, we're going to think about what UK BIM Level 2 actually is and the key components of achieving it. I'm going to leave you with some resources and uh, add on a little bit at the end, which is, like a, which is my bonus um, for you, basically, to make you think about some, some broader context things as well. But before we get into that, uh, let's do a little bit of an uh, audience participation. So, um, have we got any baby boomers in the audience? Anybody born after the Second World War, but before the mid-60s? No? Am I the oldest person here? My God, no. No way. This is desperate. Right, okay, there's two of us. Right, okay. Okay, Gen X, you were born in the mid-60s to the mid-80s. Hands in the air, please. Okay. Okay, this is, this is interesting. All right. Uh, Gen Y, millennials, uh, mid-80s to early 2000s. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Right. Okay. Gen Z, uh, 90s to the current day. Anybody? You'd be about 15. <laughs> but they're the guys you need to worry about. Because uh, basically, um, I believe, again, you know, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the stuff I'm saying today is not the party line. It's my, it's my take on what's going on. So you're quite welcome to argue with me and say, actually, John, what about this? That's fine. You know, I, I do all sorts of stuff, but I'm not giving the party line about what BIM's all about and what we should think or what we shouldn't think. I'm up for the debate because I think the more we talk about this, the better it will be. So, um, but I think going back to what I was saying, I, there's, there's a generational context to this as well because the, in my lifetime, and I'll talk about this a bit later, I've seen all this stuff happen. I remember the first calculators when they came out and they filled your desk at school. <coughs> I remember the first fax machine that arrived in my office. Now it's stuff like that, you know. I've seen it all happen in my lifetime. I had one of the first mobile phones and yes, it was a brick and yes, you had to carry it around with a handle. You know, it was, it was that sort of stuff. But now, it's not, even, it's not even the Gen Ys and the Millennials. You know, I think you guys will do a lot to change the industry, but it's the guys who are coming behind you, the Gen Zs, the guys who are still in school now, because they've always had this technology. It's part of their life, it's part of their DNA. So they'll naturally reach, reach out to Facebook or Twitter or the laptop or the, or the iPad or try and swipe a TV screen, you know, wh whatever it is. You know, even seeing toddlers playing with iPads. Have you, have you watched that? I think it's amazing. All this stuff, you know. And this is the maker, the coder generation that's right on your heels. So if you think you're going to change things, you watch out for the guys behind you because they're going to change things even more. But that's a different sort of story. So let's move on. Let's move on. So this is me. I'm an architect by background. I've been in the industry for about just over 30 years. Uh, I've worked in design management for something like 20 years now for major contractors. Uh, I've been involved in BIM to some extent. Uh, I do a lot of work with the CIOB in regional meetings. I represent the CIOB on various industry groups. I'm vice chair of BIM for SME. I'm chair of the South East Regional BIM Hub. Uh, I wrote this book. Uh, a few years ago, the Design Manager's Handbook. It's still available on Amazon. I'm still trying to get my Caribbean holiday out of it, but uh, not quite there yet. And uh, this is the a world first announcement. Um, I'm now working on the CIOB BIM Handbook coming 2015, probably some, it'll be published late 2015, with a bit of luck. And it covers a lot of the ground, some of which we'll talk about today in terms of people, process, technology, 
and some uh, ju juicy other bits as well. Uh, talks about the key documents, how people, collaboration, uh, a bit of general stuff about BIM, uh, a bit about software, and some of the issues there, uh, a few other aspects related to more traditional roles in the industry, and a few topics of interest as well. And I've got some interesting people contributing to it as well who are leading thinkers in the industry, so it's been quite interesting. So, people, it made me think actually, because I was, as I was thinking about this, we're going to trot through all the key documents for UK BIM Level 2 tonight, but it is going to be a trot. In fact, it's going to be a bit of a dash, because any aspect that I'm talking about tonight, we could spend a day on quite easily, because of the detail and the, and the level of thinking that we need to, to get to in thinking about it. But it's not just about process and documentation, is it? It's about people. And basically, uh, yes, this is a robot. You're quite right. But in thinking about people, you can have all the checklists you like. You can have all the processes you like. You can have all your handbooks and documents that you ever want in all the world. You can have all your gateways and processes um, and little flow charts where you know, somebody does one thing and then the, then the next person is supposed to do something else. But actually, people are not robots. And somebody gets out of bed the wrong side one day and they've got the raging hump with everybody and they ain't going to do what you want them to do for whatever reason. It is. You know, at the end of the day, you know, the BIM model doesn't do it all for you. You need people to engage with it. It's about collaboration. It's about teamwork. And people do not behave like robots. And I think this is uh, an underestimated aspect of the industry that we still have not got our heads around. So I want to talk about this for a little while. Because it's more like this, isn't it? It's your fault. Actually, it's not. You didn't do anything. It's okay. You just happened to be sitting there. You know. So, so you know, it's 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 this sort of stuff, isn't it? You know, we're we're um, the battle lines can be drawn for all sorts of reasons, simply ranging from our two companies are at war over some commercial issue to the simple fact I don't like the colour of your tie. You know, it could be anything in between, depending what sort of mood I'm in. You know, so, so when we think about people, the people side of this stuff, there's, there's, there's a lot of things we need to think about in the background. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to spend very long on this, because we need to get through the documents. But there's all sorts of things we need to think about in terms of the influences and agendas that people have. Uh, the leadership that we have in team situations, how our teams led, how our organisations led. We will all know of good examples and bad examples where we've experienced in our lives of good and bad leadership or good and bad management. Leadership and management aren't necessarily the same thing. And collaboration, you know, we can think about the values, the cultures, the behaviours that we have as organisations and teams, the ethics that's, that drives that and underpins that, the sort of groupthink situations that arrive sometimes when a team gangs up on somebody else or one of their own members for some reason, uh, and the sort of norms and the cultural stuff that gets built into our DNA. And the construction industry, the AEC industry, is ridden with culture and behaviours that are really poor, bad, sick, you know, what, what, you know that need to change. Uh, and part of the way that you can dis learn about this is thinking about dynamics, how people interact, how teams work, how teams interact, and you can look at types and indicators. And I've put three here, because they're my favourites, so I get to choose. Uh, first one is Myers-Briggs, which I think is really good. That looks at individual personality type. 
Belbin, which is more team focused, so it looks at how teams work and the roles that people take up within those teams. And something called the personality compass, which is uh, slightly a different take on it. Um, but it helps you understand how people work. Now, none of these are the right answer. Because we put people in boxes, we put, give them a label, but actually it's just an indicator. It's a preference. So I'm a, I was, last time I did Myers-Briggs, I was an INFP. That is how I prefer to operate. But that doesn't mean to say I can't become an ESTJ if I'm pushed. You know, it's these things, so preference, indicators, boxes, people. Again, it's people, <coughs> not robots. You know, and I think part of this is very important. When we're thinking about collaboration and building teams, it's, it's a very underrated aspect of what we do because we work in teams every day and we build teams every day, but we don't do it on the basis of psychometric profiling. We do it on the basis of who's available. They can do this job. It's not whether they can work together and do the job effectively together as a team. So I think we've got a long way to go on this stuff in our industry. And when we get CEOs talking about building teams psychometrically, as well as their ability to think about the skills and knowledge involved, we may have won the battle here. But there's a lot of stuff you can learn about how people operate. And it's, I find it a very interesting field and, and the dynamics and how it applies to all sorts of stuff. And particularly when we're thinking about level two collaboration, you know, you're wanting people to work together, to share information transparently, honestly, efficiently. They've got to want to do it. They've got to want to work together. How do you achieve that? Okay, <clears throat> so that, that's, that's people, something to think about. Again, we could spend several days on that, but you know, we're, not, we're not going to. But if you haven't looked at it before, look at some of the indicators, do a bit of reading. Start with yourself, work out who you are, and then start looking at your friends and think, what are they? How do they operate? What are their preferences? It's very interesting. You start looking at people. Okay, process. So building information modeling, um, what I didn't say at the start was I'm not doing BIM 101 tonight because there just isn't time to fill it all in. So I'm assuming you've got some basic knowledge of, of which way is up here. Uh, so if you haven't, I'm sorry, this may be a bit over your head, but you know, you'll have to try and stay with me. So building information modeling can mean all sorts of things, but actually it's an unfortunate acronym we're stuck with because really it's about an asset, it's about the life cycle, it's not just about 3D, it's about infrastructure as well as buildings, uh, it's about virtual design and construction, and the term I like to use these days is common data environment, because it's common data environment, and that's the phrase that a lot of the standards use now, where it's an environment that's set up on a project <coughs> in a digital platform where people share information consistently, efficiently, in a structured way across the whole project through all the stakeholders. And that's why it's a common data environment. But we have some BIM tools of our own that we're all born with. And they are the basic questions. And really, don't be bamboozled by any of this stuff, but just ask the old basic questions. Understanding why you're doing this, what's it for, who's doing it, when have they got to do it, what are they going to do, how are they going to do it, am I involved, what does it mean to me, and how much is it going to cost? Because it always comes down to a bit of money, doesn't it? So, if we just look at a very simplified process to start off with. So, we'll recognise the stages. This could be any asset. This could be an aircraft. 
It could be an oil tanker, it could be an oil rig, it could be a building, or it could be a tunnel. But basically, somebody comes up with a brief or a requirement, that's translated into a design, that will then be translated into reality somehow, either manufactured and installed or constructed or assembled, however you want to do it. There'll be a procurement process in here that decides how much this, this costs and who's going to do it and when they're going to do it by. And then at some point, this is all finished and we hand it over and whatever it is, it starts to operate and be maintained. So we're talking about information. The I in BIM is information. And uh, some of you guys, you, you may not have started your career yet, but you will know where you want to sit in this cycle and what you might do. And for those of us that are in the industry now, we will know at any of these stages the information that we produce or that others produce and what we do with that information. I'm not even talking about digital information at the moment. This could be information on the back of an envelope. It doesn't matter. We're just talking about raw information that I need to give to you so that you can do something with it and give it back to me so I can do what I've got to do with it. And we know how that works all around the cycle. And really, that's BIM. Because all we're doing is following the information and data around the life cycle of the asset all the way around. And that's all it is. So whenever you get fogged by this stuff, follow the information. Work out what information is being produced, who's doing it, why are they doing it, who are they going to give it to, what do they need to do with it, what do they do with it then? Do they give it back to them or do they give it back to somebody else? Follow the information around the cycle. Because once you understand the, inf the, the information flow, you can then overlay or start to overlay digital technologies onto that and understand how that might work in a BIM environment. So <clears throat> don't get foxed by the technology because it's about the information. It's about the data. We need to follow the information and data. So always think about what's happening to the information and who's doing what with it and what you're going to get out of it. <clears throat> okay, so UK BIM Level 2. This is the target that's been set for 2016 and is already in action in the Ministry of Justice uh, last year, in fact. So, um, how many people have seen this diagram before? Excellent, okay, good. So this, this, is the, this is the old, uh, quite old now, uh, BIM maturity wedge produced by Mark Buer and Mervyn Richards, who are two of the leading figures in the UK BIM movement. And basically it just explains uh, the different levels of BIM and the sorts of things that are going on in each stage. So basically, actually if we just read the uh, definition at the top, which is by uh, National Building Spe Specification, a rich information model consisting of potentially multiple data sources, elements of which can be shared across all stakeholders and be maintained across the life of a building from inception to recycling. So, having read that definition of BIM, what doesn't that mention? Let's see if anybody's awake. Yeah, how, yeah. How the information was measured. Okay, no. It's not a trick question. Don't worry. Okay, it doesn't mention 3D. And if you're thinking, ah, oh, but John, model could be 3D, doesn't it? Yes, it could. But actually, you can have a financial model or a planning model or all sorts of models. You can have a data model. So it isn't just about 3D, and this definition isn't just about 3D. It's about a rich information model, multiple data sources that can be shared and maintained around the whole life cycle. So follow the information. 
So at a very basic level, BIM level zero is just using basic CAD or even ordinary pencil drawing, like I used to do. We're just drawing stuff and we're sharing paper. That's it. Level one, getting a little more advanced now, we might do a bit of, bit of 3D. We might use some processes like Avanti or 1192-2007, which I'll talk about a bit later. Uh, we might produce some models and objects and do a bit of collaboration, and we might share some files, uh, but that's probably about the, the sum total of it. We come to level two, and basically we're doing all of that plus a bit, but basically what's happening is all the disciplines are producing their own model, and that could be some geometry, 3D, plus some data, so some information that is tagged to the model somehow. And they'll each produce their own model, and we'll be using some uh, file-based collaboration, so we're sharing files. We might be using a platform like Four Projects or A-Site or BIW, and we might have some libraries of information as well. We might have some cost data. We might have some benchmarking data for, for uh, time and lead-ins. We might have some object models as libraries as well, uh, like some of the retailers do. But the basic thing about level two is that it's what's known as a federated or composite environment. So basically, and in a way, I challenge you, this is no different actually to what we do now in an analog way except that we're using digital technology. Because in old money, and what I grew up with all my life, architect produces architectural design, structural engineer produces structural design, civil engineer produces civil engineering design, mechanical, electrical, landscape, acoustics, fire, da da da, you know. Package contractor, curtain walling, roof enclosure, roofing, whatever. Everybody's producing discipline-based information. This is just the same, only we're working in a composite environment where we can federate all those models and bring them together using a platform like, say, Navisworks um, or one of the other aggregation tools where we can bring those models together and test them and validate them against each other for cl clash detection and do other simulations, you know, like fire simulations, uh, environmental stuff, all those sorts of things. But basically, it's, it's working sort of like the way we work now, only with bells and whistles on it, in a digital environment. And the red line is this barrier between level two and level three. Because there is a lot of BS talked about level three at the moment, and certainly the BIM task group are focusing a lot on level three. And you hear, you talk to people and they say, actually, we left level two behind a long time ago. We're now on level five, you know, or we've been doing level three BIM for ages. Really? Seriously? How are you doing that? Ask them the question. Tell us how it works. Because I think there's a lot of people in the business innovations and skills department who'd like to know. You know, Mark Bew being one of them. Uh, so... so Basically, level three BIM and beyond is about something much more integrated, an integrated model environment that everybody's accessing at the same time, perhaps, in real time, doing all their stuff. Can you imagine managing the change management on that sort of process? You know, I'm trying to do something in one part of a model. Meanwhile, the structural engineer has already moved the structure and he's popped it across somewhere else. How does that work? I don't know. So, so, and also the sizes of models and files that we're going to be dealing with here are going to be huge, unless there's a sort of technical change here in terms of the way, again, we aggregate and composite models. Thinking back, if ever you get the chance to listen to Mervyn Richards talk about T5, it's fascinating. <coughs> because they were doing this stuff well over 10 years ago with computers at a fraction of the power that we have now. And they were producing federated models of T5. 
And that's the ch so it's not about computing pay power, it's about your model design strategy or your model construction strategy. And they were doing that then, and this is where a lot of the thinking in the 1192 series came from. Okay, so that's, that's what level two is. 2016 is the target for public sector projects. So basically all major government departments and even some local authorities now will have their processes aligned with UK <laughs> BIM level two, including their procurement processes. So when they put projects out to tender, they will be asking for BIM deliverables. It won't be the old way of doing stuff. They'll be sending out BIM information. They'll be asking for a BIM response. And it will be validated using BIM tools. And the winning tender will be selected using that sort of technology. So here we are at UK BIM Level 2. Uh, David Philp, one of the other leaders of the, of the UK BIM movement, talks about this as the seven pillars of BIM. Anybody like to tell me the deliberate mistake here? The clue is seven pillars of BIM. There's eight, yes. Give that man a donkey. Right. It's this one. This one is new on the new kid on the block. Um, PAS 1192 part five is now underway and will be issued as a draft uh, in, I think before the end of this year and um, will actually be issued properly um, early next year. It relates to cyber security and digital security. Uh, so it's a very interesting subject really because um, you know uh, Google uh, Stuxnet, S-T-U-X-N-E-T, uh, it a few years ago, some terrorists, some hackers, got into an, uh, hacked into an Iranian nuclear power station and uh, started the, got into the building management system and started doing funny things with the centrifuges, whatever that means. But it didn't, doesn't sound very good, particularly in the power station. There are other examples of hacking, including the International Space Station. So bearing in mind we're sticking all this information now in the cloud somewhere or some server in a dark room over in the States or wherever it is, digital security is going to be very, very important. I know nothing more about this standard than that really, other than to say the Institute of Engineering and Technology has brought out their own standard on cyber security literally in the last few months. Might be worth checking that out because I suspect the two of these documents will be very similar and have a lot of common features. So anyway, so going back to the other seven pillars, we have PAS 1192 part two, part three, BS 1192 part four, part five we just talked about, the BIM protocol, something called GSL, and then something else called DPAL and classification. And I'm gonna rattle through these now. But also as a foundation, we have BS 1192 2007. Because really, in a way, this standard is the big daddy of all of this. And it's what this, all this stuff is actually built on. And Mervyn Richards was a key, uh, a key player in this standard, and in that one, and in that one. Uh, and so, so Mervyn's had a big input here. These are the key outputs for level two BIM. So basically, you've got to have a process for a common data environment. You've got to have some form of output for your non-graphical data. That's everything else but the geometry. And uh, the UK BIM Level 2 standard is based on something called COBE, which again we'll get to. But a lot of people are actually migrating to something called IFC, which again we'll talk about in a minute. You'll also, there'll always be drawings which are cut from the model. So the drawings come from the ge geometric model rather than the other way around. Uh, believe me, there are people making models from, from, from drawings at the moment for some curious reason, but it is happening. I've heard of it happening. Uh, you need some sort of form of contract which sets out responsibilities, who's doing what, when, what they've got to do and all that sort of stuff. And you will export some geometry 
perhaps in a in a uh, a native format as a Revit file or a microstation, or as a as an aggregate file in Navisworks, something like that. So these are the key outputs for a level two common data <coughs> environment, or the key ingredients, if you like, depending which way you look at it. So this is the level two package looked at a different way. Uh, the two items in red here, which were a different colour on the columns, uh, simply, I'll talk about it in a bit more detail in a minute, but basically the, these are still a work in progress. There is some information out there, there's something called Uniclass 2, which is a classification system, uh, but it's not complete. And there is some work on the digital plan of work, which is available on the BIM Task Group website. But again, that's only taken to a certain level. And basically, there's been a competition held through the uh, Technology Strategy Board, who are now known as Innovate UK. And RRBA Enterprises, a leading consortium, who are developing some digital tools now, which will produce the classification and the DPOW sometime next year. Uh, and a few other bits and pieces as well, which we'll talk about. So 1192-2007, um, the guide to this is still available, which Mervyn wrote uh, several years ago, and you can probably pick it up for about 30 quid, rather than paying a couple of hundred quid for a British standard, because um, I don't think this one is available for free at the moment. But basically, this it's interesting though, bearing in mind when this was written, this talks about a lot of the stuff we're talking about now in that it talks about setting up the common data environment, it talks about the roles and responsibilities of different members of the team collaborating in that environment, the, the standard methods and procedures that you have to have for that environment to work, um, the specification and how that fits in with all that process, how design management works, and also some case studies from something called Avanti, which was effectively uh, some collaboration stuff that Mervyn, Steve Race and a few others did preceding this standard which uh, was basically how to collaborate in a digital environment and looking at the working processes and they had some notable successes and showed some real savings which have fed into the thinking of the uh, BIM task group. So Puzzle 92 part 2 <coughs> deals with the capital expenditure phase of the life cycle, the asset life cycle. So it talks about information delivery. It talks about the, the employer's information requirements, short, shorthand the EIRs, which is something the client and their advisors create at the start of the project. And basically, this, this document is very, very important because without it, you don't understand why you're doing what you're doing and what you've got to do. Because this is the why and the what. Because it's the employer saying, I want to use BIM on this project. This is what I'm trying to achieve. This is how you will use BIM. This is the information I want out of BIM. And this is how I will use BIM once you've finished your part of the project. And it's based upon things called the plain language questions, which you will find on the BIM Task Group website, which is a way of feeding people in to ask the right questions to produce the EIR. Otherwise, you end up in a situation where a client comes along and says, I want to do BIM on this project. And the project team say, yep, OK, I'm going to do that. And they go away, they do BIM, whatever it is. And then they come back at the end of the project and say, we did BIM, here you are. And the client says, that's not what I want. Why have you done this? It's no use to me whatsoever. It's very difficult to back engineer this stuff. You need to set these things up properly and do the strategic thinking at the right time. As an industry, we're not very good at doing that. We're very good at cracking on with doing stuff and not thinking about it. In BIM, you've got to think first before you act. You have to, otherwise you will go wrong. Because trying to unpick this stuff later on down the line is the devil's own business. And that's why if there is not 
an employer's information <coughs> requirement in place, that should ring an alarm bell and you need to go and get one. And then once you get to that point, you then have a BIM execution plan for the project, which is what it says. It's how you're going to make BIM work on the project. Part of that is understanding everybody's capability in the team. Understanding how they use IT, what experience they've got of BIM, what platforms they use, you know, all that sort of stuff. Because basically, the, the strength of the BIM or the richness of it will be only as good as the weakest member of the team. And it may be, you know, some subcontractors, a lot of supply chains still haven't, are not into this stuff yet. They need support and help. So it may be that somebody needs to help them engage with the BIM environment. Whether that's through a consultant or through the main contractor, who knows. But these are all things that you need to work out, again, before you get too far into the project. Part of this, <coughs> part of this is roles and responsibilities. And again, we're probably all familiar with sorts of matrices which set out, again, who is doing what, when have they got to do it, what are they responsible for, what are, what are they producing, all these sorts of things. And then this is an interesting one here, which I think is really, um, it throws clash detection on its head. Because whenever we talk about 3D modeling, someone says, oh yeah, and clash detection is fantastic. We, we put all the models together in Navisworks, and then we produce these reports with thousands of thousands of clashes in them. Fantastic. And then we sit in meetings that last for days working out who's going to sort out what clash. Great. That works really well, doesn't it? <clears throat> Clearly, I'm talking too much. Right. Um, basically, Mervyn actually has a very different spin on this and I think if you, if you read the standard properly you'll come across a volume coordination strategy because basically this is about having a clash free design because everybody is working within their own volume which you've laid out in your matrix of responsibility so that people are producing their design within parameters that you've agreed as a team and so then you worked out, when you're working within that volume, how you're going to touch and interface with each other. And that's why you have an interface manager. It may all be what, the same person, but it, it, it doesn't really matter. But it's a very different way to actually throwing it all into the washing machine and then getting a clash report out. It's actually thinking about how you put the model together and how everybody works, because this way, it minimises the clashes you're going to have and helps you manage the process. But actually, it's no different to what we used to do or what we do now in analogue world. You know, architect designs a scheme, sets up a concept and produces a spatial matrix, if you like. You know, these are the zones for the columns. This is where the floor slabs go. This is the ceiling void. These are the service risers. This is where the services go all that sort of stuff, you know, and basically a good concept architect will be working that stuff out and will know how these things sort of fit together in a conceptual sense. So the detail can be developed safely with minimal risk so that things actually fit within the zones that have been allocated to them. Knowing then they don't, you know, it's either something structural happens or the architect wants to change the design or the client does, does something or the services design grows for some reason. And so you've got to start shifting things around. But it's a very controlled process. And this is just the same. And I, I find this very interesting that you can, you can have a strategy for constructing a model to minimise the need for clash detection, which is what everybody seems to latch on to. And then as we get to the end of the process that 1192 uh, talks about, it looks towards 1192 part three, which is all about life cycle. And we'll see how this fits together in a minute. Of course, we, would be, we, we have to recognize that uh, there's already certification happening in the industry now. And BDP recently achieved level two compliance certification from BRE. They're the first company in the world to achieve this. 
which is, uh, which is great, and it's, uh, it's a feather in the cap for VDP and BRE and the task group, really. I think it's great. So, this is a diagram. How am I doing for time? Yeah, I'm okay. Um, this is a diagram from 1192, and I've covered parts of it up because it's really complicated. So I'm, go I'm going to let you see it a bit at a time so that we can sort of work through this together. Because this diagram really, together with the, the diagram I'm going to show you from part three, says it all. And if you can get this, you've got it. You've, well, in my opinion, anyway. So here we are. So we've got different things going on here. We've got, we're producing some information. We talked about information, so that shouldn't be a surprise. And we're talking about developing information, detailed information, through the design process. And that shouldn't be a surprise. We've talked about the asset life cycle, and it has different stages, so that's not a surprise either. Uh, we've talked about a bit about information data exchanges. So we're putting, taking information out of the model environment, and we're also pumping information back in. <coughs> and what does the client want to do at different points? They want to make decisions based on the information that they get from the model, from the, from the CDE. So let's see how this breaks down. So, digital plan of work, these are the stages. Uh, if you're familiar with the RRBA stage E, it no longer exists. We now live in a world where we work from zero to seven. Uh, zero isn't on here because it's strategic thinking, eff effectively. But we have stages one to seven on this diagram. So those are the stages of the life cycle. And this is, wait, wait for it, I'll, I will unveil the information in a minute, but this is the information growing through the design stages. And this is the information that we are producing. So we produce a graphical model, that's the 3D geometry, we're familiar with that. We produce some non-graphical data, which could, may well be stored in a proper database, like an SQL database or something similar, which links and tags to the geometry. And that data could be all sorts of things, it could be cost, it could be performance, it could be uh, post-occupancy evaluation information, it could be benchmarking data, cost, leading times, environmental stuff, carbon emissions, energy consumption, operations and maintenance information, maintenance cycles, replacement cycles, all sorts of things. So that's non-graphical digital data. And then there'll be documentation, because we always produce paper. <coughs> so we've got digital information, we've got geometry, we've got data, and we've got a pile of paper and CDs and all the stuff we usually have. And we're developing this through the design stages. So there's no, there's no great surprise here because we're expecting the maturity and level of information to develop as we go through the process. If we know less by the time we got to the end than when we started, we're in trouble. So then we've got some information exchanges, which are the green footballs. And this is either pulling information out of the environment or putting information back in. And that could be all sorts of things, you know, adding to the design information, performance data, cost data, whatever. And we've got red footballs, which are the key decision points for the client. And the reason for this being shown like that is because this, this is aligning with the public sector procurement processes. All the government departments are aligning their procurement to a lesser or greater extent with this sort of process. So decision points are in the sort of same place. They're asking for the same sort of data requirements. So people working across the public sector can expect to see the same sorts of things going on. And then round the outside, you've just got the, the cycle. And we've looked at the cycle. So we start with some strategy. What's the employer's information requirement? What are they trying to do here through procurement and so on? So actually, in a way, at first sight, this looks really complicated. But when you understand it, I think actually it's very simple 
and encapsulates everything we're talking about. And then there's another part to 1192 part 3, uh, which is uh, basically a work sharing process, which again is no different to what we've always done, except that they call it something slightly different. So, in a practice, say it was my architect's practice, I'm working with my team, we're kicking ideas around and we're saying, what do you think about this? Maybe I can do it this way. So that's work in progress. So we, we get to a point where suddenly we decide, actually, it'd be good if we could share this, some of this stuff with our team. So actually, we share it with other members of our team and we state the purpose of why we're doing that and what we're looking for and that sort of thing. And that our, our team members, our other external team members, they think about it, kick it around as well. And eventually, we reach an agreed solution for whatever it is. And that might be the structural grid, the structural frame, the building envelope, the services, strategy, whatever. And we publish it. So that then that is put up in the client shared area as reliable information that crystallizes the design of that aspect, whatever it is, at that point. And it can be used in a certain way, which is defined by the way it's issued. And then when it's superseded, it gets archived. And really, this is what we've always done anyway. It's just they put a name to it. And that's all I'd say about this. Uh, the asset information process. So we're moving into the life cycle now, having completed the construction or the, the installation of the project. We're still in a comp common data environment, but now we're producing an asset information model. Up to this point, we've had a PIN, which is a project information model. And again, we define roles and responsibilities, and we think about our information exchanges. So no change there. Now, so at this point, I just thought I'd drop in a bit of government strategy. Because really, the life cycle, yeah, the life cycle is what this is all about. And this is the holy grail that the cabinet office and the government and biz are after. Because basically, it's about the public sector using asset information in an intelligent way across the entire public sector. So it drives efficiency. It's consistent information, it's structured data, which enables all sorts of things to happen across the public sector of state. But it drives efficiency. And that really is what's behind the use of BIM in the construction industry. And if you get hold of the Construction 2025 report, and this now sets out some, which ramped up the targets that we had from the previous construction strategy, in terms of the sorts of reductions in greenhouse em emissions, lowering of costs over the life cycle, faster delivery, and also this target, I think this one's really interesting because this starts to recognise the, um, the contribution of the construction industry to GDP, UK PLC. We play, on a good day, we're worth about 10%. By 2025, we'll be a lot less than that but GDP could well be bigger. But we'll be hopefully working a lot more efficiently. So again, this is another way of looking at the life cycle. We're familiar with all those stages now. Just moving around, whoops, too fast. So we're just moving around the life cycle, doing the different things. Conceptual design, documentation, fabrication, construction, all that stuff, into operations and maintenance. And then in the whole life cycle, the operational phase, lots of different things can be happening. We can be thinking about how this, think how this building is used, how it's changed, decorated, maintained, all sorts of stuff. Actually, I was just looking at Rob, actually. How are the tweets going, Rob? There we go. Okay, good. We'll, we'll, we'll do a count at the end. We'll see whether you've reached the target. So, okay. Okay. Uh, you might come uh, across, in fact, it's worth looking up this document uh, by a guy called Richard Saxon, 
who's a past president of the RBA uh, and I think chair of Constructing Excellence. And it's called Be Valuable. If you Google it and his name, you should be able to get it as a free PDF on the internet. And basically, Richard talks through what's called the 1 to 5 200 rule, which is if we look at the relative cost of designing, construction, maintaining and operating a building over its lifetime, which could be up to 100 years or even more, then the operational cost can be up to 200 times the cost of actually building it and designing it in the first place. You can argue about the figures, but whichever way you look at it, you end up with a big number over here. So it means if we make some clever decisions here in design and construction, and even if we shave 1% or a fraction of percent off, off this figure here, we could save our clients millions. You know, making uh, a saving in, say, energy consumption or carbon emissions or maintenance and replacement strategies. Those sorts of things over the life cycle can make a big difference. And the interesting thing is I believe that we're moving to a time when clients are going to focus more on this than they are on this. And the reason is because energy costs are going up, oil is depleting, resources are depleting, uh, we've got climate change which is causing us some issues, there's all sorts of things going on that we need to think about that affect the operational life cycle of all the assets we create. So I, th I think we're just on the cusp of moving to that point now. When the energy costs have gone up just that bit more, I think it'll start to make people think. Particularly for owner operators. People that sell on, they're not bothered because they're just, if you're buying the house, they don't care. They just sell you the house or the office. But if they're owning and operating it, then the running costs will become much more important. And then this is a diagram from 1192 part 3 and I haven't covered up this one because you'll recognise it now because here we have stages, here we have the production of the information and here we have the, the life cycle. And there are these interventions, so the, 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 the 1192 part 3 process is a little more ad hoc because basically you're not quite sure what's going to happen because you know you take over the asset at, at handover uh, you might want to do some minor works, say redecorate this room and replace the carpet. You might want to do some maintenance, replace all the light bulbs, change the projector, uh, fiddle with the acoustic panels perhaps a bit, you know, or the lighting. Uh, you might want to do some major works. Actually, we'll take the floor out, take the windows out and remove that screen and make this a whole open plan space. Uh, you might transfer the ownership, the actual university decides to sell the building and somebody else comes along and they decide to turn it into flats. Uh, and then at some point, somebody decides to buy this building and demolish it because the site is worth much more to build a 200 storey residential block on it. And we'll be into Blade Runner and everything else at that point. So that was a joke, but that was okay. That's <laughs> So basically the life cycle is a lot more unpredictable, but the 1192 part 3 calls these triggers, but basically the process would be sort of the same at any point, because the BIM, the asset information model, the AIM, will be still updated, it will be current, because your facilities managers will be walking around and they'll be keeping on top of things and all the rest of it. And then information will be taken out of the model, used by the team that are doing whatever these interventions are and then they update the asset information model and just carry on. And that's really how these fit together. So we've got 1192 part 2 here and 1192 part 3 here. And it's the, it's the life cycle again. We've talked about it so it's quite familiar. These are the different stages, these are the interventions. So it's fairly straightforward. Kobe, what is Kobe? Kobe is nothing to do with Kobe smolders. Unfortunately. But it's actually a spreadsheet, which is much more exciting. There we go. So Kobe is a way of exchanging structured data 
on a consistent, structured way. So we talked about level two outputs before. We'll have some geometry. We'll have some drawings. We'll have a Kobe spreadsheet. That's it. If you can use Excel, you can use Kobe. Kobe stands for Construction Operations Building Information Exchange. It's an idea that was developed in the States and we've anglicised it. And this now it was produced as Kobe UK 2012 uh, originally as a guide and then was turned into the British Standard uh, earlier this year. So basically you've got all sorts of information here. I think this is, I quite, can't quite read that, but it's probably doors I think, or components and stuff. And you can take these Kobe outputs at different stages. Remember the, the green footballs and the red footballs, all that sort of stuff going on. Uh, so we can take that information and use it at different stages to make key decisions. And this is uh, a very tiny Kobe spreadsheet that Rob Manning produced at the CIC. It's for a Chile unit. He's listed the stages. He's listed the attributes that we want to know about this Chile unit. And there's no surprise here. It's just that as the design process continues, we get more information. And if you can read it, it starts with very conceptual general information and becomes very detailed over here. And there's nothing surprising about that because that's the way the design and, and maturity process works. So as, as the process works, we collect more data, we populate the COBEs, basically. Some people find... Uh, COBE hasn't got... To be honest, COBE hasn't got a lot of fans, to be honest. Um, it's a bit of a, a fairly blunt tool to deal with this. And there is this stuff produced by Building Smart, which is much more, um, it's bigger, it's better, all sorts of things. Uh, it's called IFC, which stands for Industry Foundation Classes, which is a much more mature way of exchanging information. And some people already, I've heard, are leaving Kobe and just use, going straight to IFC. Most, most of the, the BIM platforms have, can, can deal with IFC outputs and inputs. So I've just thrown that in. If you go to the Building Smart website, you can find out all about it. The BIM protocol is effectively a contract. So it's a contract bolt-on. It's titled the Model Enabling Amendment, and it's designed to fit with any of the forms of contract that we use in the industry at the moment. And basically, it just deals with things like data exchange, responsibilities, level of detail of the, of the model and the development process, and again, there's the inevitable uh, sort of responsibility matrix which says who does what when and what are they going to produce, all that sort of stuff. So it's a contract matrix. It's filled as a, um, a, a template and you can use it as an addendum to a main contract. And that's it. And this is, this is produced by Dale Sinclair. He calls it the contract cartography, which is how these things fit together on a contract the sort of uh, the why and the what of contracts, who's doing what, when and how, uh, the backup information you, knew, you need to support that and how this translates into a BIM environment. So you've got your contract documents, which is composed of your appointment and your protocol for your consultants, contractors proposals, employers requirements, you'll be familiar with that, scopes of service, project outputs. And then that's supported by standards and plans of work and project-specific um, items like the Pazalem 92 process and libraries of information, then you'll have a BIM execution plan and so on. Government soft landings uh, is something built upon, if you've come across, if you Google BISRIA soft landings, that's B-S-R-I-A, BISRIA soft landings is in effect the forerunner of this and the government liked it so much they brought it into the UK BIM program. And this actually is the forgotten target, I think. Because from 2016, this will be mandatory on public sector projects as well as using UK BIM Level 2. And so the requirement will be on your project, if you're working in the public sector, to have a government soft landings champion in your project team whether that's a client representative or somebody within your team or another stakeholder. But basically, soft landings is about having a good handover and commissioning 
training and aftercare process because we do a lot of good work in the design and construction process and very often it all goes to waste because we're not so good at handing buildings over to people making sure that all the stuff works they get the right keys they've had the right training to use the building management system all those sorts of things and this is about government soft landings um, having a champion in place to ensure that this sort of stuff gets thought about early enough in the project, project to make a difference. So this is the process. Again, uh, same sort of stuff but presented a different sort of way. So we've got the stages again. There's some ac actions to think about in terms of soft landings. These are the actions here and how it works. And of course we're moving into here into something called POE, which is post-occupancy evaluation. Try getting your project team now to go back to a building a year after it was finished and evaluate how it's working. Try and get them to do it after two years and three years, because this is what this is requiring, because government wants the data so that they can start to benchmark projects and understand how their buildings, their estate is performing. So, so that feeds back into this. Now, if we think about the cycle again, it all feeds into the cycle of information. I won't read all that, but there's just a few, I've just taken these from the BIM Task Group website, but it, it's, it's fairly obvious stuff, but there's, there, there's information there on the BIM Task Group website that you can get your head around. <coughs> Digital plan of work, I won't say too much about this because it's part of the, um, the TSB project, but there is information on the website about this. But again, there's no surprises here in that we've talked about the stages, and this simply shows how the model matures in terms of information and design as the process moves along. And it gives you some information there. Uh, the RBA Plan of Work 2013. If, has anybody used this website here? Okay, if you haven't, really, I really recommend giving it a go because it's free and you can produce your own little plan of work. And it's quite fun. Um, and it helps you understand the stages because this is what the finished digital tool is going to be similar to when we get it sometime next year. So I would, you can, you can get, get onto it here. Um, you don't have to register anything. It, it's, it's, there's nothing uh, sinister about it. And you can have a play with it. And it's good fun because it looks at different procurement routes and moving the stages around and all that sort of stuff. And this is, the, this is the same company that is leading the team that is producing the other tools I talked about earlier. Classification similar. Why do we need classification? Before we get into the nitty gritty of it, you know, I, I, you know we, we, the, the, why do we need classification? It's so, I can put a label on something, whatever that label is, and whatever that something is, so I can put it on a shelf, I can know where it is, and then I can find it again and give it to somebody else. And when they get it, they will exactly know what it is and what to do with it. That's all classification is about. It's simply about labelling and finding and using information in a structured, consistent and efficient way. You can argue about which tables we should have and what the name should be. It really doesn't matter, in my view. And there are people that will disagree with me very strongly on that. But at the end of the day, all I care about is being able to find the information. You can call it red, white and blue for all I care. It doesn't matter as long as I can find it and use it in a consistent and structured way and it helps me tie in with other systems and all sorts of stuff. So this, was, this is Uniclass 2.0. There will be a Uniclass something coming out as part of the digital work next year. Um, the tables may well bear some similarity to this, but there will be some differences. But basically, there will also be some semantic work available as well. So there will be an online tool that maps this stuff to NRM, BSIS, some of the other main systems that are in use at the moment. CIS, SFB, if people are still using it, all those sorts of things. So it, classification is important so that simply we know where things live, what they are, and where to find them, and how to use them. And the BIM toolkit is really that, basically, this is what RBA Enterprises are working on. It'll be online, it'll be free to industry, 
Um, so it's, it's part, of the, the part of the project. It's the digital plan of work. It's a classification system. There will also be some validation tools so that you can upload your model into this tool. And as I understand it, it will do a check on that model and tell you whether the data maturity, the information maturity, is correct for the stage it's supposed to be at. Which would be really interesting. Uh, being able to validate models in a way that we know whether we've got the right information at the right stage. There will also be some bells, other bells and whistles as well because it's, they've got to make it into commercial enterprise to pay for the free to industry. So there's going to be some interesting stuff there. I saw a presentation on it last week and it looked really, really good. So it's, it's well on the way. It's, it's looking good. And this is all about it. This is uh, a shot from Construction Manager a few weeks back uh, talking about this. So resources, um, that's level two done, actually. So sigh of relief. Um, I'm going to make you really think now, though. If you think that was hard, wait till what's coming. So, the, so some resources you can tap into, support your local BIM hub. If you're in the southeast, guess who your BIM champion is? It's me. So get in touch with me and come along to the BIM hub meetings. If you're involved in SME, you can hook up with BIM for SME. This is the BIM Task Group website. You can find lots of information there, including standards, resources, case studies, latest news of what's going on, uh, some work in progress, all sorts of stuff. Uh, also, some resources here. Uh, there's something called the B1M. I don't know these guys, but they sound quite shady, I think, from what I've heard. Uh, there's some other things here you can look at. Again, they're all free. Um, Leadenhall Building, if you get to watch it, is quite interesting. Uh, that's good fun. Uh, so a few books here. Um, I, won't, I won't go through it. If you want to buy a book, I would buy this one by Steve Race. Uh, it's, it's quite cheap on Amazon. Uh, it's, it's an easy read. He's just updated it for UK BIM Level 2. It's in plain English. He talks about everything, including contract, security, all sorts of things. Uh, you can get this. This is a free download. This is, again, by Richard Saxon. It's a snapshot of current progress and thinking on BIM in the UK. Uh, BIM Survey Report. MBS now produced this on an annual basis. And this is a survey on usage of BIM in the UK industry. And the BIM 2050 group produced this. Uh, they're thinking about the professions and the industry in 2050 and what it may be like. And some really interesting stuff here, in here about how different technologies and thinking will affect the way we work and what life could well be, well be like. Because you guys, most people here, um, you know, you'll be in mid to late career at that point. So life could be really exciting by then, I think. So, digital life. The BIM train is coming. Is it inevitable? Yeah. Well said. Thank you. I agree with you. Excellent. I'll just take a quick slip. Okay. But maybe not for the reasons you think. Because I believe, actually, the reasons for this to happen in our industry are not about what's happening inside the industry, it's about what's happening outside. Because I believe the drivers outside our industry for this stuff to happen are far more powerful than anything inside our industry at the moment. Things like, you know, we've all got, we've all got one of these we carry it around. Actually, somebody made a, an interesting comment the other night. If the government had forced us to carry transponders with us everywhere we went several years ago, there would have been an outcry. But now we're doing it by, by of our own free will. We can be tracked. Our whole lives are tied up in these things. You know, there are big data machines in black rooms all over the world that process all our digital lives, our transactions, our emails, our texts, our web browsing, um, our financial transactions, our credit history, our criminal offences, our um, underpants size, inside leg measurement and all the rest of it. They know it. And even when they say, oh, this data's all been aggregated and anonymised, not so. Because by using big data tools, they can cross-relate databases. 
And it's very easy to identify people from different pieces of data and work out, actually, ah, so that's who they are. It's a very big brotherish world we're living in now, and it's all due to the technology and the data and the information that's behind that. And that's why I believe this stuff has got to happen anyway, because our lives are going digital. Our lives are digital, and they have been for several years. It's just now the processing power is really ramping up. So the people with the money can do all sorts of clever things with this data and information. And the information is power and commercial advantage. And basically, it's starting to link up now. There's a lot more talk about uh, smart cities, smart homes, intelligent buildings, turning your boiler on or off with your smartphone on the way home, ordering the shopping, you know, all, all this sort of stuff going on so that um, the whole built environment is starting to connect up in a world of information and technology. And BIM is the missing link because it enables buildings and estates, regions, countries to link in to the digital environment. And so buildings with lots of sensors and intelligent operating systems can be talking to all these sorts of databases and systems. And there's really a lot of uh, sense in all that happening, irrespective of when, whether some CEO in a construction company wants to use BIM or not. Because that's why it's going to happen. Because the forces outside driving us towards a digital life are huge and immense. And that's why this stuff is inevitable. But for some people, they, their reaction is a bit like this. They're just stuck in the headlights and they don't really know what to make of BIM. So, they got a choice. They can get run over, <laughs> or they can get out of the way, or they can get on the train. And I think really it's an interesting time for our industry because you, you will find people in different camps at the moment, even now. I think when, they, when we're talking about BIM adoption. But of course, I said be worried about the uh, Gen Zs, didn't I? This guy, this little guy here, is five. His name is Ayan Kuresh, or Kureshi, and he's the youngest Microsoft certified professional in the world. He is five years old. He's got his own computer network at home, which he built. So, however good you think you are, I'd be worried about him, you know. <laughs> and anybody who's following him. Because this, this is the generation now. These are the makers and the coders. You know, I was at um, Technopop with Class of Your Own a few weeks back, and we met some little guys there. They were doing coding and making stuff. Absolutely amazing. Now, some kid, he was about 10 years old, he stood up and did a presentation on his own. He had no team. His team deserted him. He did it himself but he was so confident and knew what he was doing. It was fantastic. So these guys are the ones to watch out for, I think. But there is hope for us as well. So just a, just a different perspective. I'm almost, I'm almost on the last legs now, so that's OK. So just looking at what's happening uh, in our world, we've got information on a global scale, industry business project. It's digital data and information, and it puts us in touch with all sorts of people. And we can look at it in terms of, it's all out there, and I'm right underneath it all. But actually, the better way to look at it is, there's all this stuff available, 24-7, 365, and I'm right in the middle of it. I can find out all sorts of stuff any time. You know, we're, it's almost like these things now have to be surgically removed, isn't it? You know, you, you, the impulse to look at it every few minutes, you know, for the latest email or tweet or something, you know, is interesting. And this is just how Apple has developed over the last 20 or 30 years. I had something not dissimilar to this in around about 1990. It had a 40 megabyte head, uh, hard drive. I've got 64 gigs in my pocket. You know, the... the um, the, the processor on the, on the command module of the Apollo 11 mission had something like 
16 kilobytes, was it? Some ridiculously small amount of, of memory and processing power. But this, this and the iPad and the iPod have transformed the way some industries actually change. If you look at the way iTunes and MP3s change the music industry, that shows how digital technology can transform an industry. Because overnight, it changed the economic model of how that in industry operated, because it meant that musicians could get straight to their audiences, to the people that would buy their records, uh, their songs, and uh, it changed the whole structure of the way the, the, the economic model of the industry operated. And the construction industry could be facing a similar sort of wave. And we've talked about the smart city movement, there's all sorts of things happening all around the world now where smart cities are being built from scratch with sensors in all sorts of things and we get these very natty headsets to access all the information. There's all this stuff going on and it's happening all over the world now as well where people are looking and combining data from all sorts of different sources and connecting the built environment. But you can access it on a tablet or a smartphone or all sorts of stuff. And we probably not, well, yeah, we can do all sorts of things in a BIM environment, but actually uh, where we've seen a lot of action recently is 3D printing, isn't it? There's all sorts of things going on now in all sorts of sectors. It's not just the building industry, but they've now got a 3D printer on the space station. The US Navy are using them on their ships. Uh, doctors and physicians are using them to create prosthetics, all sorts of things. There's all, and there's ro automated construction happening there. There's a semi-automated semi bricklayer in existence. Skanska are going to make a, a concrete 3D printer and use it on their sites. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Change is a constant. So I think we're in a, a really Darwinian time for our industry. And in evolution, some things succeed and some organisms fail. And I believe it's a similar challenge for our industry. There are organisations now that would appear to be at the very pinnacle of our industry. And it may well be because of the impact of this te technology and their failure to respond and adapt quickly enough, they will be gone inside 10 years and taken over by other people coming in without the baggage and using the technology to do things better, more efficiently, quicker, uh, with a better commercial advantage. And we're already, already beginning to see it where BIM, where people are using BIM to win and deliver work. You know, it's not perfect yet, but it will be. It will get there. So what next? So we've talked a bit about, you know, stuff's going to be, we're going to be much more mobile. The, the sale of mobile chips for mobile devices is going through the roof. Desktop technology is, is not on its way out, but it's uh, in a reduced role now, I think, to some extent. Uh, we're going to be connected on many more levels. We're going to have automated manufacture and assembly. There's technologies around um, not just IT, but materials like graphene, very strong, very thin, very light. You can do all sorts of things with it. Uh, being able to 3D print in all sorts of materials. Why not have industrial size printers on site? You just have lorries of goo turning up and you make the stuff on site and install it rather than shipping stuff over from China. It could change the way our industry supply chains work. Uh, our job roles are going to change. We're going to become networked, more evolved. Um, we'll have virtual teams, virtual projects, all sorts of stuff going on. Uh, and I think we'll become more technical, more professional. And I think in the end, I'm hoping this will lead to our, our industry being much more esteemed and respected because of the quality of what we do and how we do it. We'll be more specialized on one hand, but we'll also be sort of multidisciplined on others because this technology enables us to move into the traditional domains of other disciplines. So architects can produce their own quantities and do their own pricing. You know, and in time, as the software and the data libraries improve, why can't we access 
different parts of building design. Why do we need main contractors? We can give the model or aspects of it to subcontractors and deal with them direct. We can plan the logistics ourselves using, using 4D. You know, there's all sorts of things we can do. So BIM might be an answer, but it's not the silver bullet for everything. And this is where we are. This is the BIM lens. And this is where we might be. So I think we're going to be much more concerned about the life cycle. There'll be much more techn technologically enabled disciplines and professions, a lot of overlapping. If the institutes don't respond to this a lot more quickly than they are, I think they're on the way out in their current form. And we'll have some sort of super institute. Uh, and also, it's quite possible that some sort of left field organisation or business will enter our industry and clean up. You know, somebody who hasn't worked in, in construction traditionally before, say Google or Apple, supposing they did buildings, what would they be like? If Apple did buildings, what would they be like? They would be perfectly designed. They would be beautifully wrapped. They would come to site. You would open the box. It would be perfect. It would work. And it would ooze quality. You know, it's this sort of stuff we've got to start thinking about. Otherwise, somebody else will do the thinking for us. So <clears throat> my advice to you is to be thinking about all these things. So th keep an eye on how BIM develops and all the technology related to it. Keep your eye on the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, because that's connecting everything up. And BIM is part of that jigsaw. The smart city movement. Did you know we have a, a standard for smart cities, a smart city framework in this country? Because we do, yes. Somebody's nodding their head. Uh, we're going to be much more mobile and cloud connected. Big data is going to continue to play a bigger and bigger role in our lives in the way people use information about us. It's our information. And you know, people are using yours and mine information and we're not making any money out of it. That needs to change. Uh, and there's going to be a lot more convergence and crossover between sectors uh, and industries and disciplines where suddenly we'll all be able to do all sorts of things because we've got the technology at our fingertips. So that's me done. Uh, these are my contact details. Um, if I'm happy to, if you want to email me, with questions or thoughts, I'm happy to continue a discussion online. That's fine. So that's about it. Um, I'm a little over time, but... Uh...